In an increasingly globalized world, where countries are no longer isolated from one another and instead interact with one another on a daily basis, we think it's more than important for individuals to understand the capacity behind state actions, to understand the actions that led us to where we are today, um, for a new benefits that we're going to list today on side proposition, which, why, which is why we are proud to propose the motion that this House believes that school history should only be taught from an international perspective. Today we're going to prove to you that not only does it have benefits, it is both justified and it is a necessity that there are gaps in the current system. We think side opposition has to prove to us that there are more harms to this, there is no justification, and furthermore that there's that, that the current system is adequate in and of itself. So what are we talking about today? Well, this house is obviously the world. We think it's more of an ideal, principled motion. We're not going to be forcing anybody to undertake this model, but we think there would be benefits to all states in this. So what we're talking about is both in two situations, it is sort of two prongs. First of all, we think schools and history class should teach the history of all major regions of the world. So mostly, when you're in your own country, you only hear the history of sort of the regions surrounding yourself. You think you should care about all major regions of the world, in specific time periods, the major events. This would be sort of similar to the um, advanced placement compared government curriculum, where you learn six to eight major countries, Russia, China, Mexico, Iran, Great Britain, and their various histories and the actions that they play out in the world stage. We also think that you should be gaining an unbiased perspective of your own national history. So the international view of how your country acted on the world stage, what sort of actions your country took place in the treaties you signed, how you cooperated with other countries, um, we think that's important for you to know from an unbiased perspective. Of course, you could teach your own uh, national history, but it would be for a limited time because you have to get to all the other ones. This would be sort of similar to the International Baccalaureate World History Program. So what I'm going to be presenting to you today on side propositions are first two arguments. I'm going to be talking to you about uh, history and education, our principal argument, asking what is the role of education and why history specifically. Then I'm going to move on to talking about biases and multiculturalism. My partner Jessica is going to finish up with a more pragmatic point about globalization. So first of all, we need to ask ourselves what exactly is the role of education? We have three sub points yeah. under this. The first off being an agent of so supply chains. Socialization, right? So the school, along with things like your family or religious institutions or governmental institutions, are taught to be an agent of socialization. Now, what does this mean? It, first of all, it teaches you how to be a citizen, right? But in a globalized world, it's no longer enough for you to be a citizen of your own state. You have to learn how to be a citizen of the global community. So you have to learn how to be a unified citizen, and you need to learn the principles that you should abide by, not only as a citizen of your own nation, but also of the nation of like, the world. We also think that under this um, idea of being an agent, you learn of what is expected from you, so how you should act towards other people and what you should expect to gain in return. Secondly, we think that what the point of school is to give you the capacity for success, right? That you get specific skills in order to gain a level of education that will gain you a spot in the workforce, that will garner you a platform for further education. We think it's to give you skills to live and to go on further. My partner Jessica is going to explain more, so I'm just going to flag it for now. But basically, we're operating under the assumption that as you, all, as you interact with more and more countries, um, you need to know like, more and more about them. Yes. So I'm actually pretty curious. Who exactly is going to establish these international perspectives when we speak about controversy? Okay, we think that it's like pretty clear, right? Because when I learn about like um, issues in China, I learn about them from like the Chinese perspective and all of the other countries that were involved in the issue, right? Like we think we we often teach things from a nationalistic perspective because it's more beneficial. The nation has like pride in their actions. And they don't want to admit that perhaps they did things were like could have caused harm. So we don't think that like all the practical issues they're going to come up with are going to stand as much weight. So now thirdly under history, um, or like what the role of education is, interaction with other people. So you learn how to make friends, respect, teamwork, and we think it's especially important because this is where you spend the majority of your life, right? So we stress the importance of learning this as a youth because that's when you learn your cultural and social attitudes in your formative years. So it's not enough to simply be exposed to these attitudes when you're an adult because at that point they'll simply roll off your back because you've already been molded into the attitudes you have now. We think the current system has gaps, so it's not only justified, but it's necessary. So why in history class specifically? Well, first of all, we say that we learn history to not repeat mistakes in the past and also to establish patterns. So we operate under the consensus that to improve is to be better off, to improve our society and to not make past mistakes that hurt individuals is a good thing. And we also think it's important that you understand the ramification of actions and also show those effects. So what happens when I enter a war? What happens when I engage with trade with other countries? What has happened in the past when I've taken various political and individual actions, right? So we think examples of this would be like historically Easter Island. So what happens when you have a mismanagement of resources? 
Or like in terms of slavery, what happens when you occupy whole groups of individuals and ask them to work for you? Like we think that if you can understand the action of things, you can actually improve yourself and make rational choices because you can understand the capacity of all actions. Secondly, we think it explains actions and attitudes, right? So a lot of children, especially in youth, have questions about why the world is. And we think it's excellent for them to ask this. And furthermore, on our side of the house, we think it's a benefit that they understand it from a well-rounded perspective. So they understand why the world is how it is. They understand why we have created things like human rights, why we have organizations like the United Nations. So they understand why countries act very differently to one another in specific situations. Why some countries engage in free trade, why some countries are protectionist. We think history explains a lot of this. Thirdly, though, we'd say that like, there's a cultural and philosophical thought of a region, right? So we think that historical actions are often due to your cultural and political philosophy. How you respond to attacks, how you respond to decide to engage with other nations and other groups of people is based upon your own political philosophy, right? So in China, like the principles of Confucianism or legalism take a large part in how they control their citizens or the terms of colonial attitudes. So countries that were once colonial powers versus countries that were themselves colonized, you see a difference in how they respond and how they think of themselves as citizens. Sort of. Yes. So do you know that right now we are all also presenting international perspective and also national perspective? No, we really aren't though, because the majority like countries don't have the incentive or they aren't required to teach the history of other countries. Like that's why this resolution is in place. Okay. Um, finally biases yeah. and multicultural. So first of all, we need to talk about like nationalism in a unitary perspective. We think there are harms of overzealous nationalism, and that happens when you only learn not only the only the history of your state, but also from like a very positive point of view. When you're taught that every war you entered was justified, every group of people that you may have harmed was for a greater purpose, that your country made no mistakes, and that everything was justified. We think that this leads to excuses for xenophobia. It leads to excuses for not engaging with other groups. Of because you are only hearing one side of the story. This leads into like stereotypes and biases, right? Because we think if you can explain the reasoning behind someone's actions, you're more likely to view them as a legitimate group of people. So they don't just become like that crazy group of international people, but you can actually help debunk the stereotype behind them. This is especially important to increase social contact in unicultural states and regions where they wouldn't learn or even interact with these individual entities. We think that when you can have a knowledge and logic of why a group of people act based off of their history, you can actually gain an amount of respect for them, and respect can at least lead to appreciation. Once you have an understanding, and understand that they are rational actors, right, and can understand the motivation behind them. We think this is why you have like the International Baccalaureate Program. It was created to fill a need, right? Like they saw a need for individuals to learn on a world basis, and that's why they created a program that was so international, involved individuals from all levels. That's why you have schools like United World Colleges that bring together students from all over the world to learn together and to live together because they recognize the importance of sharing in culture, sharing in appreciation, and learning from history. We are proud to propose. can be taught in school, because we are talking about history, that is where that should be objective at least. Now, the, the proposition team ha has, to, has to prove us why, how exactly they keep this, uh, they, keep, uh, uh, they keep all the neutrality in, uh, by uh, teaching uh, history only from international, only from, uh, in, in, from international perspective. Because at the end of the day, history should be objective, and that's what, that's a, uh, that's what uh, that's what history about history is about. And we are talking about all kinds of history. It's not like history is teaching you how to be a citizen. It's not like history is actually teaching you how to interact with other countries. It's not like history encourages you to uh, uh, 
uh, uh, to um, to cooperate and uh, and so on. And they are saying the fact that you no, know, we are not going to force anyone to do that. But by implementing this thing, by by saying the fact that we should only learn uh, history from international perspective, you are undermining your uh, their. Uh, uh, the perspective of, of a specific country that is uh, that is uh, teaching history. So the simple principle, no, thank you. The simple principle that they are uh, uh, that they are giving us today is undermining another principle that is equally uh, that is equally important to uh, to to what they to uh, to what they propose. Let's take a look a little bit at uh, uh, let's uh, let's take a little look at the. Their case, and they have had no thank you. They have had two uh, two uh, two arguments at the beginning of uh, this debate. First of all, what is the role of education? And we, I I I told you the role of education is not uh, the role of history. Uh, particularly, is not to teach you how to be a citizen. It's, to, it's the role of history is to teach you objective um, objective uh, objective facts, objective reasons, which then you are. Uh, 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 and uh, teach you the fact that you should be able and teach you how you, you will be able to uh, uh, to uh, relate to those facts and to compare them and so on and so forth, how to really judge them, not say. We have also uh, been told that, you know, this uh, uh, this uh, uh, current system has gaps, but we don't know how uh, they are going to mind this gap, but we are only uh, we are only going to uh, be taught history only from uh, one perspective. Uh, no, thank you. Rather than uh, if we are going to be taught history from more perspectives and so on, and we don't see how exactly these gaps are met, are are minded when we are only restricting uh, restricting some areas in uh, uh, in uh, this uh, particular issue. No, thank you. Now, uh, then, uh, we have also been given the examples of some uh, like internet, uh, of some issues. I don't know, like uh, why do we have human rights? Why do we have slavery and uh, and so on? And for these, I think that uh, we, these things are already uh, taught in school. These things that are already in yes. okay, general Western education wouldn't teach you things like ancient Chinese history and like the basics of legalism and Confucianism. How do we include those thought processes in our schools? Actually, through what we propose today, and, and uh, you will see in my substantive case. Now, getting back, they are telling us that you know uh, these issues are not uh, currently learned um, learn in school and so on. But, they, but actually, they are actually in school at the uh, uh, universal history and so on. You are taught all of these things, and we already have in our system, uh, in our uh, current system, these kind of uh, this kind of. Uh, uh, this kind of uh, education, so that they understand at the end of the day why we do work as a whole, why we do, um, the, why are the, what, what are the factors that lead to uh, that lead to glo uh, globalization? No, thank you. And we uh, we also see the fact that by this uh, by this uh, that this current system works actually well, but if we add something to it, and you you see in the um, I uh, in my in my case, it should be even better. So uh, we are all, we have, we also see the fact that um, uh, we also see the fact that two proposition says that you know multi uh, uh, cultures and cooperation between the states uh, you know it's a good thing and so on. But we, uh, we actually we we ask the question how are we going to get this through uh, learning history at uh, learning history from this international perspective? No, thank you. Actually, how we are going to have cooperation when we uh, when we teach uh, history in schools at such a level, and we go home and our parents tell something uh, totally different to us, and we see that uh, there there will be contradictions in uh, what we are what we are told uh, what we are told in some places, and the contradiction with what we are told in some other places. Now, present to my understanding, actually, what we are uh, uh, what we are standing for today is that uh, history from international perspective cannot even cannot be taught without history from um, without history from your own national perspective. They cannot really uh, they cannot really exist without each other because they are they are connected and uh, and uh, no thank you and uh, history it's a uh, uh, if you are talking, if you are teaching them uh, history from uh, such a, a subjective vision, we are talking about distortion history. Uh, no, no, thank you. And we see that you know history has uh, uh, has different uh, different types of interpretation, but we need to uh, we need all of them to be taught in order for the uh, for the child then to decide upon uh, his uh, 
from Bali and this children. And that's the first argument is about. It's a interdependence between these uh, between the, these two kinds of uh, teaching history. And my uh, colleague is going to talk about uh, uh, is going to talk about the second uh, about the second argument. Well, actually, we, we propose this. In uh, the first, uh, in the in the first years of school, they have to learn history from the national perspective, and then in the further years, they will be learning history from this international perspective that that the theme or proposition is uh, talking about. And we see that you know at the end of the day, we stand we, we stand for the same thing. We actually agree with the fact that <laughs> we need to have this international perspective, but we see. We, we say the fact that it cannot exist without learning national perspective. Because the motion is that we should, you know, thank you, that we should learn only international perspective. And the proposition has to prove me the fact that how do we keep, uh, how do we keep uh, these, all, all these uh, objective things when we are learning only on international, um, only on international perspective. First of all, why do they have to learn history on nas um, from national perspective? Well, uh, because they have to, they have to relate to their country, and even if you are talking about globalization and so on, we consider the fact that at the end of the day, um, uh, each individual and each citizen has to relate to their country and has to know exactly what their uh, countries, what his country's beliefs are, and so on. And we consider that this fact, uh, that this fact should be done in order for them to, uh, to actually, uh, to actually realize of uh, what kind of state, uh, what kind of state they are part. Now, learning international international perspective, you know, it's important because they have to uh, take in uh, uh, take in consideration how their country looks on this international stage, um, on this international stage, and so on. But what do we get at the end of the day is that the kid goes home and uh, puts on the table the two uh, the, uh, these uh, two principles and has the uh, has the right to value them as uh, according to his own beliefs and so on. So we consider at the end of the day that the kid is the most objective one to realize what uh, what he should believe in, and we consider at the end of the day that not school should be the one um, to teach him what is right when it comes to history, because it has to be at the end of the day the most object uh, the, the most uh, ob objective class. So for all these reasons, please support this one. So let's look at exactly what stance they took today. They told you essentially the main crux of their debate or their case was that like, an international perspective is a biased one. They told you that a couple of times, and we don't really understand where they're coming from. Because an international perspective means you're not just learning one country's perspective, one country's history, one country's biases. You're learning countries from all over the world. You're learning multiple countries. And we think that your own natural history might be one of the majority of countries. Like, that's legitimate as an international perspective, but it's one of many. We actually think that that supports principles, like the ones we talked about today, where kids make their own decisions about what they believe. That's exactly what supports our side of the house. All principles and philosophies and biases are laid out on the table, and people can make decisions for themselves. That's beneficial. That's what we told you down the bench today. The main swallow of our case today is they said that, like, yes, we have to teach international history from poorly. Essentially, they're seeding a lot of our argumentation. But they said, okay, for the first few years, you have to learn a purely natural perspective, a biased and nationalistic perspective on history. We take offense to that. We say that we're not okay with entrenching kids with stereotypes when they're at the youngest, most vulnerable, and most likely they're just going to take on the information and cut themselves off with things in the future. 
who say to you entrench stereotypes young, if you teach people that like other cultures are like strange or unusual, entrench stereotypes that are harmful, they actually don't think that five years down the road, when you enter your like older years of high school, we can suddenly turn around and teach international history when in like the same way we could when we were younger. Because we think you already entrenched like this assumption that your country is always black, right, that your country won a way more. That's the offense you make in their case today. So what I want to do now in my speech is first of all go through some refutation of what we exactly saw from their sense of how today. And second of all talk about my point, that is the idea of global Sure. So you're, so you're defining international perspective as, as international history? International history, both in terms of you learn like all the different perspectives that countries have and their biases, in terms of who won wars, like what philosophies that take on, and you learn the history of like every country in the world. Not every country, but like a country in all of the major regions, whoever was like important at any time in history. I think we need that very clear in our first speech today. So how did they refute Julia's idea today? In terms of their model, they told you that world history is already taught in universities. We have some problems with this. First of all, we say university education is not compulsory. It may be the case that a child will never ever learn about the history of India or the history of Iran, major players in a global world. We also think that like it's not really taught like universally in our schools anyway. I, as an individual in the Western world, learn about the countries that influence Western thought, that influence my country's history. I don't necessarily learn about the history of countries like China or India or Iran in my school or like Brazil or and we think that that's a huge problem. In terms of refuting her first point, they told you that your, like, education is not about teaching you to be a citizen or like cooperation. We take offense to that. We say that we spend you know, 10 years in school in order to like, develop a child who will be able to interact with society and be like a national citizen as well as an international citizen. We don't see a problem with school like, teaching that. And they told you that like history only teaches objective facts and reasoning. We don't think that's true because history is tied to things like teaching you about the major philosophers of any time of history. You can't learn about like the Renaissance without learning about like all of the individual people who influence scientific thought and the philosophy of the modern world. We also think it's tied with like cultural perspectives. We don't think that like, any of their argumentation is true here. Finally, in terms of biases, we told them that kids will go home and their parents will contradict them. We say that's exactly the problem because the parents entrench like incorrect ideas about other countries. Correct ideas about other countries that like don't take into account other perspectives or where they're coming from or the historical basis for their actions. That's why we have individuals who like refuse to interact with people from other countries or think they're like strange or like evil for some reason. We think that like incredible bias and sort of like fear or xenophobia is harmful. That's why we propose this motion today. My point today is that a success in the globalized world. Sure. So do you believe that learning national history raises xenophobia? Uh, we think that learning it without learning any other culture does. And we also think that like your, your history should be like one of many views put on the table. We think that like when countries try to enforce like propaganda or nationalism through their education system, which often does occur, that's incredibly harmful. That's what causes things like world wars. That, that's what causes things like people refusing to inter interact. And we actually think it causes practical harm, which is what I'm going to get into right now. So globalization. We say the world's open borders, where you have things like the EU, like NAFTA, where you have things like the UN making international decisions, and where like immigration and travel is even stronger than ever before. Decisions that are made need to be those that are international. People who are like trying to deal with things like business, people who are trying to make political decisions in other countries or like deal with them, need to have some sort of globalized perspective. And I'm going to show you why in three major subways. The first is this idea of success in the global world. So this will look at things like, you know, like business, politics, and capital. And we talk about the idea that culture is intertwined with history. So when you go to another country, when you try to interact with them, there's certain like cultural gaps that we don't think that you should be able like, that are problematic to make. So for example, in um, certain African cultures, it's actually like um, considered bad if you touch someone with your left hand because historically that's what we use to like clean up like methods and like vermin and like things that were dirty. We think that like just knowing that as a businessman, so you're not going to like turn off another culture, make them angry at you, or like make them shut you out, is actually very beneficial. And that's why many like businessmen who are adults actually go to classes to learn about like international culture, like which sort of like cultural practices will make the most successful from a business perspective. We think that that's very beneficial. 
So when Nixon went to Berlin and said, it means I'm Berliner, which means I am a donut, rather than I am someone from Berlin, that was a huge cultural gap. Like, those countries made fun of him for. They realized that he didn't actually understand their culture. It put them off his government. We think that that's really hard. We say that also these um, cultural things, or history forms a uh, context for modern issues. So for example, a lot of people in the West didn't know that when um, the U.S. went into Kosovo and bombed um, Kosovo, they accidentally bombed a Chinese embassy. Even though this was something that made like Chinese people have like riots in their country at the time, it actually put them on a business with the West for a very long time. We think that just learning these perspectives is beneficial. You can understand where countries are coming from. Like we, are, we think that in Iran, the fact that like a lot of people don't know that the U.S. entrenched dictatorship um, and entrenched. Uh, their individual before like the current regime. Because one of the reasons they actually had this like uh, revolution, and one of the reasons that they're so angry at the West today. We think that understanding those perspectives is essential. Finally, we talk about thought processes. So we say that countries have like philosophical ideas that may not be sort of like liberal democratic Western ideals, or may not be the sort of ideals that you learn in the classroom. So I primarily talk about things like Confucianism, which assumes that you need to respect a benevolent authority figure. It essentially is this idea that like autocracy as long as it's benevolent is good, or this idea of legalism, where people are too like inherently innately evil and self-centered to actually control themselves, and you need like a controlling like leader above them. We think that these sorts of perspectives are things that politicians, that individuals elsewhere in the world don't understand about other countries, and that's really harmful. Finally, we talk about soft power. We think that countries actually like it when other countries understand their culture because it means that they'll more likely to rely on issues. This is why China has created schools to teach Chinese culture in over 80 countries. Soft power is a great thing. Globalized perspectives are an excellent thing in terms of business and politics we propose. Thank you very much. children do not know about anything about their country. And that children they only learn in a, that children learn only in their country about national history. And that they do not have any access that in school they are not in in any place, in any kind learn international history. Which is an extremely false premise that they build their case. Due to the fact that uh, when you develop yourself, when you receive education in schools, you are also you are also taught national history, and there you are going, you are taught international perspective, and so on and so forth. And what we should demonstrate as today is the fact that you know it's better to uh, learn, it's better to uh, educate them and to learn them on international perspective, and to let the national perspective away, the beliefs that the beliefs that that country away, and this should be then this should bring them more benefits than presenting them both. So considering all, all, all these facts, uh, we believe that, first of all, this, uh, this, is, a, this is a wrong premise that they, they will the case. Moreover, we cannot, we cannot assume the fact that learning what your country believes in, the facts of your, his, your country's history, and what you are actually and what actually, how actually was formed your country and the relations that your country had with other countries from your national perspective raises xenophobia. It only makes you aware of your country perspective, then furthermore to learn about the international one equally not presenting only the international perspective. A, 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 more, a bigger problem we have in the fact that we do not understand how exactly are we going to set an international perspective. How exact, who is exactly going to choose this international perspective? Are the powerful countries going to impose their own perspective in their own perspective and to make uh, this even, in this, and to make uh, history even more subjective, subjective 
and the objective uh, perspective that what the goal of an international one would be actually, would be actually in existence. Wait, what are we? Uh, we don't reach a falsification of the history in the deficit of in the deficit of a in of a powerful country to impose it, its will. Therefore, we do not see any kind of benefit from this international perspective. To the to the fact that the proposition team today affirms that they are not going to oblige anyone to apply this plan. Therefore, the countries that are that are going to desire to keep their own national perspective are not going to have any that are not going to have anything to suffer, and moreover, the, this international perspective in, is not going to help them anyway. So, more, so considering all these facts, we do not see how international perspective could work in a real world when uh, an international perspective will be set by will be set by various will be set by various uh, by various factors as a powerful country is. So. We do not see how learning your national history makes you makes you unable to learn the international one. You cannot see why you should learn only the international perspective, in a second, only the international perspective, and to uh, put away your inter your national beliefs, your country, own, your own tradition, and so on and so forth. Yes, not. Okay. In Canada, we're talking more about being involved with like actually won by the British, even though all sort of history, historical facts say that it's a stalemate. What's that idea of the trench? How do I like learn anything else about that history? So when you are going to impose inter when, when you're going to impose the international perspective, this is our problem that we do not know how exactly who exactly this international perspective is going to uh, say that it's right. Who exactly is going to be the country that has more uh, has more leg legitimacy in this international perspective because we see be because we see that the international perspective should be most of all objective, which is extremely hard, which is extremely hard to maintain. And therefore, we have we have a system today that presents you all the implications, all the factors. Moreover, this is we are let, moreover let's just think about the implement implementation of uh, this system in countries and. You know, how exactly are we going to force on a teacher at school to uh, to don't present the, the national beliefs and the national opinions and only to present the 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 big picture, the big picture worldwide and so on and so forth. And moreover, regarding the fact that you really not are going to learn about a uh, Chinese culture, even if your country has never uh, had never and then more contact with that country. Well, that is international history. And when we're speaking about international perspective, we speak about international perspective regarding what what countries uh, involved with your country and so on and so forth. That and what should and what is beneficial and what is beneficial for children for children as we should right now. It's a system that we have. Uh, it is the system. It is a system that is already implemented, which is international history for from both national and international perspective. So considering all of these facts, we believe that we should we should uh, we should also present them on international perspective with the uh, with opinions of other countries involved in treaties, conflicts and so on and so forth. But we but we should keep also the national perspective which is learned in school in, which is learned in schools as um, as important for the development of an individual, the fact that he was raised in that country, that is important for you as a citizen to know uh, what happened in your country and so on and so forth. So here I'm reaching to the second point, which is globalization. And we do not think that it's an impediment for globalization and for being a global citizen, the fact that, well, you might know how to, the fact that you know your own roots. It's a benefit for the globalization to know the implications of the implications of your own uh, national history and also to the like, international perspective. So because the international perspective that they present that it's a very confused one. It's a very uh, it's a very complicated one. And so the Nazi how this is going to how this is going to be presented to in schools when uh, when 
when what teachers should do should be presenting them step by step in order to children children have a big picture, in order for the children to under to fully understand all the to fully understand all the implications and what uh, really happened. So considering all these facts at the end of the day, that position today stands for, for justice and for a good presentation of history. A presentation that is subjective as it is presented from both sides, national and international perspective. Considering all these facts at the end of the day, we beg you to propose. Ladies and gentlemen, to this point, this debate has really been plagued with a failure to differentiate between what is a national perspective and what is an international perspective. We've seen all opposition really trying to lay claim to many of the ideas which are inherent in the resolution. And so during this speech, what I'm going to do is I'm going to clean this up for you. I'm going to show you why it is that the international perspective is definitely the best way to look at history. So first, let's try and get a, an idea for what's the difference between a national perspective and an international perspective. So quite simply, when you're looking at what you're going to teach, it's really you're asking two different questions. In one situation, you're asking, what happened to us? That is a national perspective on history. Looking at the history of your country, and looking at it from the perspective of the people who lived there, and from the people who lived through it, your ancestors, the people who founded your country. Whereas when you're looking at it from an international perspective, you're asking, what happened to the world? And in this case, that means you're going to look at what happened to you, but not necessarily just your perspective. You have to look at the perspectives of the people that were the people that were in a national perspective of them, as well as the perspective of you. And so what we're seeing is such opposition seems to think that under the status quo, we really teach a very international perspective everywhere in the world. And while this might be true in Romania and in some other countries, there's certainly a large portion of society and not just autocratic regimes, not just places like China or like Iran, but places even like America, where a very patriotic version of history is what is taught. Where in America, American history, in fact US history, is an entire class. And they like to teach about the Constitution and why freedom is important, why the Constitution is important, why the development of Renaissance era ideas are important, without ever looking at Oriental Eastern ideas, without ever looking at Middle Eastern ideas, and really looking at mainly an American perspective. So it seems that there are in fact certain situations, certain places, where everyone says, well, we do teach an international perspective. But there are a large number of places where we don't, and that's where we're applying this resolution. This resolution isn't going to change the International Baccalaureate Program, which we said actually teaches a very international perspective. It's going to change US, US history programs, where they only talk about Paul Revere and what happened in the American Revolution without an international understanding. Now, this really breaks down to two different things that we're going to be looking at. It has a breadth of viewpoints and a breadth of history. And let's start off with a breadth of viewpoints. Now, we heard a lot of argumentation from said opposition saying that this is going to be a biased perspective, that it's going to be more biased than a nationalist perspective. And what we say is that, yes, in fact, history isn't objective. Well, side opposition seems to begin their original argumentation, saying history is objective, it's just one thing. And then went on to say, well, we're going to force other people's perspectives on history. And that in itself is a contradiction, saying on one hand the history is objective, and on the other hand that we can teach something in different ways when it's just an objective thing. We say they're actually correct on their second count. When they said there are different ways of looking at history, that is the accurate statement. However, when you look at multiple perspectives, rather than just one, you end up with a less biased view of what happened. You can, of course, remove bias entirely, but a nationalist perspective only looks at what the people of your nation think, what happened to people of your nation. Whereas when you look at international perspective, you look at what happened to everyone in the world. And this variety of viewpoints is what differentiates this resolution from the current system and why it's better. 
Let's look at a real life example to sort of bring this, make it more concrete for you. So let's look at Israel and Palestine. Now, if we were going to teach a nationalist perspective in Israel and in Palestine, this is what the Israeli Palestinian conflict might look like. Let's say we're in an Israeli classroom. They might teach you that in 1949, the original partition for Israel and Palestine was created by the UN, and it was ratified by the uh, Jewish leaders. However, the Arab leaders refused to ratify the UN set what the, what the UN set out as a partition and invaded Israel, and then Israel fought back. And that's how the borders were originally created. Then we can look at the Six Days War, where the Arab countries again decided they wanted to eradicate Israel off the face of the earth. And so Israel had a preemptive strike and ended up being very successful in this war and took out most of the Arab forces arrayed against them. And then finally, we can look at examples where they withdrew and forcibly resettled their own people out of the Sinai Peninsula in order to create a peace with Egypt. And these are all accurate and a true understanding of what happened with Israel. And it's real historical facts. However, there's a biased perspective when we see that when we go to the Palestinian perspective, where if you were teaching in a Palestinian classroom a nationalist perspective, we might see that the Palestinians were there first. And in fact, the Jewish were coming back to this area, which was really Palestinian homeland, for many hundreds of years. That the reason that we originally created Israel was because of Jewish guerrilla forces that were attacking the British people in under control at the time. We see the UN partition, which was the original international setup, is nothing like the current borders, and that there are many Jewish settlements outside of the borders of Israel in Palestinian controlled land. Now, these are both true statements. These are both true understandings of history. What we see is that these are very biased and very nationalistic. And if you were to teach the Israeli one to Israeli people and the Palestinian one to Palestinian people, it's going to be very hard to resolve this conflict because the populace and the citizens of these countries, along with their politicians, believe that they're in the right and the other countries are in the wrong because of their nationalist perspective on history. Whereas if we are to teach an international perspective, we teach both of these sets of facts, that both countries did do bad things to each other that both sides have done wrong, and we can create a way of looking past the conflict, and we have a much better, actually, I'll take you in a second, we have a much better chance of resolving the conflict because we have a full spectrum of understanding of what the other people think and what your ancestors think. Don't you agree? No, but what? But how exactly are you going to reach the point since you said that it's not going to be mandatory, the implementation? What we're saying is that if this were implemented, it would have these benefits. This, this isn't a this house would resolution, it's a this house believes that. And we believe that the implementation of this resolution would have these benefits and it would be a good idea. So that really, questioning whether how it's getting implemented isn't a part of this resolution. So we see that there's this benefit of conflict avoidance by having multiple perspectives and multiple viewpoints on history. Now let's move over to the other side, we're looking at a breadth of history. Where instead of a national perspective, which is very much, although it might teach about other countries, it generally teaches about how other countries influence your country. And so by having a breadth of systems, we might learn more things about what happened in the world. Why yes. exactly we need to teach them only international history and not both national history? This is a big misunderstanding inside opposition of our case. We're not saying you don't teach national history. There's nothing in this resolution about national history. It's about a national perspective. When you teach national history, you have to teach it from an international perspective. Of course, it's important for a Canadian to know what happened in Canada. But it's not necessarily important for a Canadian to be taught a patriotic version of events where we burned down the White House in the War of 1812. That's true, but it's not really an accurate understanding of what happened. And that's a nationalist perspective. There's an international perspective where it was truly a stalemate. You can still learn Canadian history, but we're learning our history from a global perspective. And that's what I was talking about with multiple viewpoints. You look at the viewpoints of other people. Now we're moving on to the other side, where you all do learn more international history, because when you're looking at what happened in the world, there are lots of important things that happened that weren't in your country. And so this increase in international history will be very useful in many places. Firstly, it'll decrease xenophobia. The more you understand other people, the more that's going to allow you to understand where they're coming from. It's also going to allow, in an increasingly globalized world, people to move back and forth and be useful in other areas. If you know the history of Europe and the European Union, that would be helpful for a business person who is American coming to Europe. He would have a better understanding of what he's working in. So what we see is there's two sides to this. You're going to have a breadth of viewpoints and a breadth of history. You're going to have an international education for an international citizen. And that's what we need in today's world.
I'm sorry that by this point in this debate, the, re the resolution still hasn't been understood by the team proposition. So what we don't understand is that the resolution stands for the fact that history should be taught from an international perspective. The fact that I, as a country, should learn uh, from, uh, from, a, from a perspective that is, is somewhere high uh, over the other perspective of the world, and which is a neutral one and uh, doesn't have any subjective uh, opinions coming from the world. What they uh, think today, the, or the motion, is about uh, that we should learn international hate history. It's not what it, it is about, that a country should learn uh, that about uh, the history of another country. It is about the fact that a country should learn uh, the general history from an international point of view and not put its own uh, interest. When, uh, what uh, the proposition should have done today is show exactly how this perspective is going to be objected by the, by the end of the day and show exactly how this international perspective isn't going to have uh, no thinking, isn't going to have uh, any uh, ideas coming from uh, these uh, powerful countries as we see that uh, the USA uh, is uh, the powerful country in the world and uh, its opinion uh, manipulates uh, uh, in all sorts of domains and we see the fact that uh, if uh, we took a problem to implement this uh, plan they bring us today. No, thank you. Uh, we would have some problems. The fact that uh, the uh, impact we want to have and that to uh, teach uh, everyone a neutral history won't be uh, achieved by the end of the day. Uh, <coughs> uh, well, uh, as we see, uh, they do not uh, prove us how exactly this plan is going to work and why exactly we should accept it. Yes, sir. Well, no history is neutral. Isn't having multiple perspectives better than having one? Yes, it's better, but we see the fact that we, we uh, no, it's better to have uh, kids start uh, in school, uh, both from an international perspective, which we say is dangerous, because we cannot assure the fact that it is going to be neutral, and also they need to be taught from a national perspective. But th uh, this, is going, this uh, is what I'm going to uh, develop on my... Uh, uh, further points, and that are uh, first of all, why uh, this is not going to be obje objective. Second of all, why the actual system is working that we don't want to uh, uh, bring this uh, option. And second of all, I'm going to uh, talk about what they bring today, even if they are not proving the motion, uh, and uh, about what history is teaching uh, today. Now, let's move forward to uh, talking about why uh, it is uh, not going to be objective. and. So on. as I said, uh, we are going to uh, have this model of the uh, powerful countries that is going to take over this measure and we won't be able to implement it as it should. And we see the fact that teachers won't be able to implement this in school, no thank you. As we see the fact that I as a teacher, I live in America and of course I'm not going, I'm going to put my own, uh, uh, my own room opinion about uh, some subject in history that would, uh, as I'm a citizen of America, I support it and I'm going to uh, uh, to sustain uh, what America stands for, not about what an international thing stands for. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, so national education about national history is so important. What happens when you have an immigrant move to another country where they would never learn about their own national history? Well, we see the fact that, well, in, uh, as we know, in uh, Western Europe, which uh, uh, is a um, less developed uh, part of the, of the world, we see the fact that we in school do learn international history and we do learn about world wars and immigration and so on. And we don't see how exactly I, if I move to uh, Germany, I won't, uh, I, I'm not going to know anything about this country as I do learn in school about it. No, thank you. And we see the fact that at the theoretical level it sounds good, this motion. Uh, what, uh, the fact that it is going to be that international perspective. But we see that uh, in practical, uh, in practical, we are not going to have uh, the benefits uh, the promotion team uh, wants to. Now, I'm going to move on talking about uh, how the actual system is good and why we should not teach this kid only from an international perspective, but from the national perspective also. Well, we see that uh, these kids which are in school where they are not really uh, as developed as they could and uh, well, this is what school stands for, to educate them and to uh, put, uh, to make them uh, learn uh, some uh, things uh, from a uh, good uh, uh, point of view. So we see the fact that they also need to see what their national uh, 
perspective is over uh, history and how exactly why our country was uh, was uh, uh, was active in that thing and we don't want to uh, let only the international perspective uh, to be taught by our kids. We want they uh, we want them to know how exactly uh, uh, my country and someone in case uh, was uh, doing in that time and what he did. No, thank you. Uh, more than that, we see the fact that this to, uh, uh, teaching about the international perspective and national pers perspective uh, goes hand in hand, and we see the fact that we need to uh, teach them from both of both point of point of view points of view in order to make them uh, create, uh, after all, a good opinion and make the, uh, make sure the fact that they do see the problem and the history uh, event from all points of view they could get. And we need to assure the fact that school is going to teach them um, all of this. Uh, well, we see the fact that if we are going to implement this, we are going to know, thank you, to have uh, bad effects, um, uh, first of all, over the country because uh, his some history and so on will be degraded and uh, his own perspective won't be taken in consideration anymore. Second of all, all the students, as they, uh, no, thank you, as they uh, won't know uh, the actual opinion of their own country about uh, that. And third of all, on the international platform and how exactly conflicts are going to start because of implementing this method. As we see that one country will uh, think the fact that uh, well, this perspective is not a good one, so I'm going to uh, uh, get a fight with you because you say that. No, thank you. Uh, now I'm going to move to uh, uh, rebuttal what they brought us today, even if they do not prove the motion, and in fact, about what history is teaching act actually, and why exactly uh, implementing uh, uh, this international history is doing what they want to do, uh, uh, only this. It's not going to, you know, thank you, bring us these benefits. So we see the fact that in school kids are already taught international history. If they wouldn't be, well, how would these kids know exactly about how other countries work and about Iran and so on? Uh, well, we see the fact that they also do not prove us how exactly, uh, they can make the link to how exactly only teaches them international history. It's going to uh, bring us this benefit and the fact that, well, uh, a kid when he, if he immigrates, he's going to do this. And we see, in fact, that uh, by learning him both international history and national history, and national history, we are not bringing any uh, any bad impact. And we see the fact that they, as a team proportion, have to stand for only teaching them international, as the motion says. Uh, well, they brought us examples uh, when a uh, well, uh, man went to Germany and uh, didn't know how to talk. Well, this is a problem of learning the language, and if you want globalization to work so well and so on, or maybe we should put more accent on learning languages, not uh, history, which would make this uh, easier. They also say to us the fact that World War, uh, started, uh, World War started because of the fact that uh, well, people do not know uh, other things about their country. Well, this is uh, not true, and they do not prove uh, the motion. Uh, more than that, uh, we see the fact that the country has the uh, right to do this. Uh, uh, thank you, and please about the motion. Before getting to the main points of my reply which I would like to raise a simple question. What does it mean to learn history? First of all, it means to learn dates. Second of all, it means to learn facts. And third of all, it means to learn some concepts and uh, to have the ability to relate to what the to what you learn and compare some uh, and compare the facts that you that, that you have uh, that you have learned. Now passing to uh, the four major points of my uh, of my speech. First of all, what does it mean? The uh, what does it international perspective mean? Second of all, I'm going to talk about objectivity. Third of all, about uh, what do we stand for? Uh, what do we stand for at the end of the day? And third of all, ab about uh, uh, about the real about uh, uh, what the real education actually uh, actually is. Now, first of all, getting back to um, the fourth, uh, fourth thing, what is actually international perspective, and how how we see this? At the end of the day, well, international perspective means that I uh, that I as a, a, 
a citizen of a country, learn about my country from the perspective that other countries and from the perspective that the world has uh, the world has about me. Well, we agree with the fact that this may be important. Uh, this may be important for me because you know, living in the present, it influences me and so on. But on the other hand, first of all, I have to learn about what my country says, uh, about what my country thinks, about what my country, uh, what my country believes, so that uh, so that I can I can uh, really uh, I can relate to it and I can uh, really be part of uh, and I can uh, I can be part of uh, that um, uh, of that particular country. And we consider at the end of the day that we should learn both of them, that we should have. Uh, we should have both. Um, we, should, we should have uh, both of them, so that I will be able to decide what uh, what I or uh, what uh, I do believe in at the end of the day. Now, passing to to, to the second uh, uh, to the second point about objectivity. Well, they are saying uh, the proposition in states that uh, you, you know the, uh, the, we are going to uh, learn this uh, uh, this history from this international. Uh, this international perspective, and everything is going to be uh, is going to be a okay. The problem is that these big powers that we have uh, that we have on the international stage make the whole history. The problem is that these big uh, these big powers uh, um, uh, can make uh, the history sound in some other way that uh, your own country uh, that uh, your own country uh, uh, that your own, uh, that sounds uh, in terms of uh, in terms of your country. So we have to. Uh, so we have at the end of the day the, uh, uh, to compare the uh, the vision upon uh, these uh, upon these issues from uh, these uh, from this big stage and from the the world stage, and uh, we should also take into consideration how my country, how my own country sees that uh, that particular issue, because we are talking about big, big countries that obviously are um, are more uh, more developed and more powerful than my own country. So. Uh, uh, and, and we consider that um, in order for, for for us to understand, we should take into consideration both of, uh, uh, both, of uh, uh, both of the issues. Now, at the end of the day, uh, this and this leads me to uh, to my third point uh, about actually what uh, uh, what we stand for. At the end of the day, both things uh, stand for the same thing. But the motion says that you should uh, that we should learn only uh, history from international perspective. Yeah, perspective. And we are proving at the end of the day that this may be important, but we have to we have to have them. We, we have to have both of them in order for us to understand what team proposition wants to wants to implement. And we cannot uh, understand what proposition team stands for if you don't have uh, if you don't have national if you don't have uh, uh, history from the national point of view. Now, uh, this leads me to, uh, to to the last point about uh, real education, about what uh, education, uh, about what education really is about, and the fact that you are put on the table all all, uh, all the possibilities and all the things that uh, that, uh, uh, that that we, that we have at the end of the day. You must you you can have the capacity to uh, to, to relate to this fact that you have been told and to decide upon what you should believe. So at the end of this, uh, at the end of the day, uh, do you stand for this one? today inside opposition in terms of the benefit that our model today on side opposition showed you. And there were a lot of concessions and admittances that right now we do need to learn things like international history. There are major benefits. And because side opposition didn't actually give us enough concrete harms, we don't think they've taken the case today. What I'm going to do for you today in this final speech is I'm going to divide the debate up into two questions. I'm going to ask firstly, what are the effects of teaching this resolution? This uh, first of all, I'm going to ask them, what is the role of education in history, like the principal question, and then furthermore, what should it look like? Secondly, I'm going to ask what are the effects of teaching teaching it this way, and look at like the effects of nationalism and globalism, that, or globalization that we're giving issues in the debate today. So first of all, what exactly is the role of education in history? 
they told us like that the state shouldn't teach people how to act in school. That was both their constructive and their response to work for me. But we told you in reputation that you told you like the formative years of your life, like the first 16 years in school, is to make you develop as a citizen. It's an agent of socialization to become a global citizen. And if they never touched our points about increasing interactions with other people, your capacity for success from those sorts of things. So let's move on to what should it look like. They never answered our POI about how they get it otherwise. When Jessica asked that in the first speech, their first speaker said she would address it later on in her speech and never did. They never gave us an alternative way for individuals to learn international history and the benefits of it if it wasn't included in the school system. That was a problem on their side of the house. They told us that history should be objective. But what we told you in response is there's nothing more objective than to learn your view is one of many, that your view is not exclusive and your view is not automatically right. They had a major problem with the fact that like, they thought you couldn't make history unbiased, like that international history unbiased. We had two responses. First of all, they never explained why their current system is any better, where you only learn one bias. And secondly, it's that there is a global common understanding of what happened in history. Like science and history is most typically objective, and scientists and anthropologists are typically objective people. Like they didn't give us enough concrete analysis. And they can see it multiple times that you actually need to learn international history. So they think that like they haven't, like that they agree with the majority of our case. So then they told us that like, well, the child should decide for themselves. And then they said, under our resolution, they'd be conflicted. We had two responses. First of all, we told them, absolutely, this child should be able to decide what views they associate with. And that's why they deserve to know all perspectives of the issue. And secondly, we chose that that's the problem we remedy under our side of the house, that when the child goes home to a household where their parents have been entrenched with a specific stereotype of individuals, they're not going to get it under way, any other way than under our model. Those stereotypes will continue to be entrenched. They told us that you're like, you're already taught it. Um, and we, what we told you in response is that you're just taught about with your own region. It's not vastly different. They never told us why nationalism is so much more important than our model, just that nationalism was good. There wasn't enough analysis. Finally, they told us that, like, well, you need national history. We said explicitly in our model that we exist. They continued to carve on that time of the So secondly, what are the effects of teaching it this way? So do national history and international history cancel out? They told us we should teach it later on, like in university. In response, we told them that you can't entrench stereotypes of other countries that your view is right in you because you can't change that after it's been modeled and formed within the end of individuals in their point of view. We told you that universities and compulsory individuals won't necessarily get it. And again, they conceded to the benefits by saying that like, people should learn international history. Nationalism and globalism. They never touched our third argument about like the benefits to learning it in the political and economic world. They just said that President Nixon should have bought a better German dictionary. We don't think that was a good enough attack to fill that point. They also tried to tell us it wouldn't lead to xenophobia and you should develop as a citizen. We told you about social contact that they never touched. We told you about understanding philosophies of other cultures and why that's important. They didn't outweigh that enough on their side. So because the benefits we provided to the outside opposition still stand, because we did enough the concrete crimes weren't identified to the outside opposition, we are proud to Thank you.